This week's blog post is the 17th in my series on a visit to the Wadsworth Athenaeum. It includes more 17th century Baroque art at the Wadsworth. First up, Eustache Le Sueur, Young Man with Sword, around 1645. The artist, 1616 to 1655, one of the founders of the French Academy, is best known for his religious paintings. But here, he evokes portraits by Raphael and Titian, two masters of the Italian Renaissance. The works usually included pops of vivid color, such as Titian's Man with a Blue Sleeve. Lucerre's palette is almost monochrome, but that makes the sitter's face stand out and very personal reaction. I happen to like this young man's face. I also admire the expert way that Lesseur has depicted the shine and the crispness of the sitter's sleeve. If you'd like to spend more time with this painting, try analyzing it as I analyzed Holbein's Sir Thomas More in How to Analyze and Appreciate Paintings. In that essay, I worked through a series of questions to help you systematically observe the details of a painting, state what effect they have, and set them in the context of the rest of the work. In the process, I made tentative statements of the theme and then a final statement of the theme. And finally, I evaluated the works in emotional, aesthetic, philosophical, and art historical terms. A revised and expanded version of How to Analyze and Appreciate Paintings is in the works, and it will be similar to last year's Getting More Enjoyment from Sculptures You Love. Next, Hedda's Still Life with Goblet, 1631. Hedda was a master of still life such as this, luxurious food and tableware that sparkle with light and are crowded with textures you can almost feel. When this work was created in 17th century Holland, still life painting as a genre was at its pinnacle. Dutch merchants had built a trading empire that stretched around the world, and they reveled in the exotic goods their wealth could acquire. Building on two centuries' study of artistic technique developed by Renaissance painters, William Kalf, Jan de Heem, Heda, and others produced superb still lifes such as had never before been seen in the history of Western art. For more on this genre and why the French Academy considered it second-class art, See my essay, Still Life's History and Significance. This is Agnello Falcone's Cavalry Battle Between Turks and Christians, painted sometime before 1656. Battle scenes had been a popular genre since the Italian Renaissance. By the mid-17th century, though, artists such as Falcone, 1617 to 1656, were painting not leaders of armies or the main battle, but events happening to particular anonymous soldiers. Here the largest, brightest figure is a Turkish rider who gallops away, looking back in terror at the melee of men and horses in the background. This battle between Turks and Christians was not as exotic or distant a scene as you might think, if you're looking at today's political map. During the 17th century, the Ottoman Empire controlled Europe almost as far west as Vienna. Falcone worked in Naples, and as a result of abetting Massaniello's revolt in 1647, he went into exile in Rome and then Paris. He was finally granted permission to return to Naples, where he died during the plague of 1656. Be careful what you wish for, I guess. Next up, Claude, also known as Le Lorrain, landscape with St. George and the Dragon, painted around 1643. Landscapes were looked down upon by the French Academy, so French painters who loved painting outdoor scenes invariably inserted a narrative, even if the figures were quite small. You can see my essay, Landscapes, History and Significance, on why that is. Claude, 1600 to 1682, was born in the Duchy of Lorraine, and he followed this tradition even though he spent most of his working career in Italy. The composition is not symmetrical, but it is beautifully balanced. If you shift a tree, or the mountain, or St. George, or the terrified maiden, the scene wouldn't be as visually satisfying. But, while Claude's landscapes are pleasant and well composed, I often feel like I've seen all of them several times, even when I'm seeing them for the first time. That's the price Claude paid for being so influential. Many, many later artists imitated his style. If I studied his immediate predecessors and his contemporaries to get a sense of what was innovative about his works, I might find him more interesting. 
it reminds me that Maxfield Parrish was also widely imitated, but I know his context, so I can appreciate what he was bringing to the table. And of course, I like the sense of life in Parrish's paintings. And speaking of sense of life, this is Rysdale's view of the dunes near Blumandal with bleaching fields, painted around 1670 to 1675. Rysdell, 1628 to 1682, one of a family of Dutch painters, painted landscapes, seascapes, and cityscapes. Not being under the dominion of the French Academy, he didn't feel the need to insert biblical stories or other narratives into them. The landscapes he depicts are flat, and honestly, they leave me flat. I cannot find a way to get emotionally involved with them. But they were very influential on 19th century landscape painters such as Gainsborough, J.M.W. Turner, Constable, and the Hudson River School, as well as Van Gogh. I've given you a link to that in the blog post. The Wadsworth label points out that bleaching linen outdoors in the sun was an important part of textile manufacturing. Holland was one of Europe's leading nations in this process. DianeDurantyWriter.com has hundreds of posts on sculpture, painting, architecture, and my other obsessions. To join the free Sunday Recommendations email list, visit the URL that's on the screen or email me. And you can say, well done, Diane, or support my work and receive rewards by means of the tip jar on dianedurantywriter.com. As always, thanks for listening.